not like a scissor, not like a pencil, more like a word processor for gene editing. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. David Liu, Director of the Merkin Institute of Transformative Technologies and Healthcare, Vice Chair of the Faculty at the Broad Institute, Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So give us a brief uh, summary of your background as it relates to gene editing. Uh, I'm a chemist uh, by training. Um, and uh, uh, one of the hallmarks of chemistry is that uh, chemists are interested in manipulating the structure and function of molecules, uh, small and large. And so uh, one uh, way in which uh, I've taken this interest is to uh, manipulate the structure of macromolecules, of proteins and nucleic acids, in an effort to create molecular machines that uh, can make precise changes to DNA sequences, including changes that are relevant to human genetic diseases. You led a team of researchers to develop a groundbreaking new gene editing technique you call prime editing. Tell us about it. Uh, so um, maybe to, to tell you about prime editing, given that uh, you have a very technically sophisticated audience, I'll start by uh, presenting some background on the problem that prime editors were developed to help address. Um, i turn off my humidifier as <laughs> I'm drowning. Uh, so uh, the six billion DNA letters in each of our cells can change in many different ways. Uh, there are 12 ways that you can change uh, any one of those DNA letters to another letter. Those are called point mutations. Uh, you can also delete letters, uh, you can insert new letters, and of course, uh, combinations of all of the above can also create uh, special kinds of mutations. Currently, there are more than 75,000 known ways to change human DNA that's associated with genetic diseases. And collectively, as you might imagine, they cover all these types of changes. Uh, for example, sickle cell anemia is most often caused by a specific A, in a gene uh, called HBB or hemoglobin, uh, it's one of your, your hemoglobin genes that's been mutated to a T. Uh, and uh, if you have two copies of that A to T change, then uh, you have a high likelihood of having sickle cell anemia. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease is most commonly caused by the insertion of just four uh, particular DNA letters uh, at a specific position in a gene called hex A. Uh, and most cystic fibrosis cases are caused by the deletion of three consecutive DNA letters in a gene called CFTR. Uh, so this large diversity of DNA changes that can cause genetic diseases really contrasts with the fact that uh, there are very few different ways of uh, programmably changing uh, DNA sequences in mammalian cells. So one of the first and most important ways uh, is the use of programmable nucleases. Uh, so programmable nucleases include zinc finger nucleases, uh, tail nucleases, and more recently, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, these uh, programmable nucleases are like molecular scissors in that they make double-stranded cuts in DNA, uh, breaking both strands of the DNA double helix. Um, and the most common result of cutting DNA is that the cell makes uncontrollable mixtures of insertions and deletions, which are also called indels, at the cut site. So making double-stranded cuts can therefore, in DNA, can therefore be very useful for disrupting genes or for moving around large segments of DNA. Uh, but cutting DNA to make precise changes has proven difficult uh, the methods to do so, such as homology-directed repair, or HDR, uh, unfortunately don't work very well in the vast majority of uh, cells of therapeutic interest. And most of the outcomes from cutting DNA uh, still contain these uncontrolled mixtures of deletions and insertions uh, that arise from the cell's natural response to having a chromosome cut into two pieces. So the second class of editing agents that are widely used in mammalian cells are called base editors. Uh, these are agents that our lab developed in 2016. 
uh, base editors have been likened to pencils. So uh, they use the targeting ability of CRISPR, but instead of cutting the DNA double helix, they directly rewrite uh, one DNA letter into another letter without uh, making a double-stranded DNA break. Um, so base editors can correct four of the most common types of point mutations or single letter DNA changes efficiently while avoiding these uncontrolled indel byproducts uh, that result from cutting DNA. Uh, but base editors cannot make any of the eight other ways to change one base to another DNA base. Uh, and they cannot make precise insertions or deletions, such as those needed to fix the extra or missing letters uh, that cause Tay-Sachs disease or cystic fibrosis. So in this new uh, study that we published uh, just recently, uh, we described the development of prime editors. Uh, this is a, a versatile and, and new approach to uh, editing mammalian cells very precisely that, like base editors, does not make double-stranded breaks in DNA, uh, but uh, it's extremely versatile in the kinds of changes that, uh, that prime editors can install. So if uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and other programmable nucleases are like scissors and base editors are like pencils, then you can think of prime editors uh, to be like molecular word processors uh, since they're capable of actually searching for target DNA sequences and replacing those original DNA sequences with precisely edited uh, new DNA segments. Can we cure or prevent diseases with prime editing? Uh, well, it's important to realize that uh, prime editors, like any genome editing agent, are molecular machines that make specific DNA changes. Uh, they do not, uh, that's, that's really all they do. They do not uh, automatically cure a disease. They make a change, uh, and if you program them uh, uh, thoughtfully and uh, do experimental work to validate uh, their use for a particular pathogenic mutation, you can use them to reverse uh, mutations that are known to cause genetic diseases. So in our recent paper, we used prime editors to directly uh, reverse the mutation that causes sickle cell anemia, changing it back to the normal healthy hemoglobin gene sequence. And we also used it to remove uh, the four extra bases that are inserted into the hex A gene, uh, thereby uh, changing the, uh, the gene from the inserted form that causes Tay-Sachs disease back to the normal form. Uh, but that's not the same as saying that uh, one can automatically cure sickle cell anemia or cure Tay-Sachs disease, because making a DNA change that corrects a mutation that causes a disease is not equivalent to curing the disease. Uh, so it's an important step for some approaches to curing the disease, but one also has to deliver these uh, molecular machines into the right cells in patients to make those changes. Uh, you have to be able to target enough of the cells that are causing the disease to have uh, a benefit to patients. Of course, you need to check that the agents are efficacious and are safe, and you have to understand all of the potential consequences of of uh, delivering them, of the delivery vehicle, as well as the agent themselves. And you know, for many diseases, there is not just a single genetic component, but there may be many genetic components, or even more complicated, there may be a mixture of genetic components and environmental components. So simply being able to reverse a genetic change that is associated with disease, or even that causes a disease, uh, is only one piece of an important quest to actually cure a genetic disease. What are the ethical considerations that go along with gene editing? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly an important issue, especially as these editing technologies become more and more capable. Uh, we, uh, I, I think we should always keep in mind the importance of maintaining this continued dialogue between uh, regulators, scientists, doctors, uh, the general public, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, we are maximizing the likelihood that these uh, agents are deployed to do good uh, and are deployed in thoughtful ways that minimize 
uh, their, their risk of either misuse or their risk of inadvertent harm. Um, so that's certainly an important issue. I, I think most people uh, would agree that um, using genome editing to treat an otherwise untreatable disease that causes great suffering or death is ethical. Uh, indeed, many believe that it would be unethical uh, if we have such capabilities to not move towards these applications as the technologies mature. Uh, human improvement is a more ethically and scientifically complicated scenario. And of course, there's a whole continuum between treating a grievous genetic disease uh, and uh, installing a mutation that might uh, lower your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, for example. Uh, such a mutation was just reported uh, recently um, and further characterized in a, in a paper published today in Nature Medicine, not by our lab, by others. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, so, so there's a whole continuum of scenarios that uh, I think the public's uh, uh, view of and their comfort with uh, are evolving, just as the technologies that enable these kinds of changes are also uh, developing. Um, now, many uh, scientists and non-scientists alike have advocated for a moratorium on clinical germline editing, meaning the use of uh, editing, genome editing to edit human embryos uh, to create babies that would uh, pass their edits down to their offspring. Uh, while one day that may be uh, uh, medically uh, justifiable, uh, maybe even an important uh, possibility, I think currently the cost benefit, the risk benefit analysis doesn't really uh, favor making such uh, such applications for genome editing, and therefore I support uh, this moratorium on uh, clinical germline editing. Dr. David Liu, Director of the Merkin Institute of Transformative Technologies in Healthcare, Vice Chair of the Faculty at Broad Institute, and Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Quite the title there, uh, Dr. Liu. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about the work that you're doing, uh, how can they do that? Yeah, so uh, the, maybe the easiest informal way to communicate with me is uh, through Twitter. Um, uh, my Twitter handle is David R L I U. Uh, we also have a lab uh, Twitter handle, Liu Group. Um, or they can use our website where you can uh, download all of our papers, uh, all of our publications, and uh, many of the detailed protocols and supporting information needed to, uh, to research further or to use our, uh, our, our research. Uh, our lab's website is lugroup, L-I-U-G-R-O-U-P dot U-S. Uh, and uh, just about every useful DNA blueprint that we generate, including the blueprints for these new prime editors, have been deposited with the nonprofit uh, repository for, uh, for DNA constructs called AdGene. Uh, so going to AdGene, uh, you can get for nominal cost, uh, you can get these constructs if you wish to try them in your own lab. Sounds good. And thanks again for joining us and your continued uh, work in this area. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you could do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching. <laughs>